welcome to this week's edition of Indigo Living's On the Couch series for leading women. This is actually one of my favorite jobs because I get to share inspiring stories of leading women across the region. Now it's the end of the year, so I'm, I don't know, I guess I'm saving the best for last, but <laughs> this episode is something so special. Kavita, well, she's known as the conscious parent on Instagram, but her actual career journey is so transformative. She will inspire you on how to find your passion in your career, as well as tips for leadership, relationships, and of course, being the best parent possible. So here we go. Kavita, welcome. Rosamund, thank you so much for having me. So you have such an in interesting career path <laughs> because I met you when you were at the helm of editor-in-chief of yeah. Cosmopolitan, which is major, at Masala Magazine, like yeah. the leading publication for Bollywood, when really you started your career in, I want to say mathematics, <laughs> right? Like, yes. it is so God. interesting. Yeah, yeah. This, You know, honestly, I... I think I'm the standing example of how uncomfortable you are in your skin till you reach the age of, I mean, for me, it was the birth of my son. I started getting really, like my truth, I could not unsee myself. But you just have these identities and live your life and do things without really thinking about it or without really feeling it, you know? Well, let's start with your first career yeah. path. Okay, so, you know, I lived all over the world. Um, I was a nomad. Uh, from India to Africa to Switzerland and in the States. But what was that journey? How did you become I, a My childhood. Your childhood? You know, my childhood. So I was in India till I was so I was six and we'd, we moved around India, a few cities in India. And then my parents moved to Cameroon in Africa and I was in boarding school. Wow. Um, but of course, home was Africa. So in Cameroon. So that was till the age of 12. And then we moved to Lugano in Switzerland and I went to high school there till I was 17 and then I went to college in the States. I went to Vassar in New York and then I did my grad school in Boston at Tufts. So I literally, and then I worked in New York City um, and then I moved to Dubai. Um, so it's been quite a journey. So you're talking about the uncomfortableness, but yeah. at that age, as a young student or a young yeah. lady, yeah. you have been in so many uncomfortable situations yeah. because changing high schools as yeah. a teenager, Forget that, Rosemary. Private school, moving countries. Yeah. Those are a lot of uncomfortable situations. Forget that. The most uncomfortable was being a seven-year-old in boarding school with my five-year-old sister, you know? And, and the pain of that, I literally buried so deep inside um, for my entire life till I had my son. The pain of that. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll get to why. I mean, my I, I grew up with a mentally unwell mother, and I'm South Indian. We don't talk about ill health. Mm -hmm. uh, my father is wonderful, but he was so uncomfortable with it. He just put us in boarding school because he couldn't deal with it. And it was, I've taken care of her as far as I can remember, you know. So being alone, not having that, I mean, it's, it's, that is the pain. So as you can see, that set the stage of me being completely disconnected from myself. And, and I told you something earlier when we were talking, and this is not coming from a place of ego. It's literally just, it. It's a fact, you know, and I think a lot of people would resonate that, listen, I'm, I'm a South Indian, you know, we're very cerebral. <laughs> I've always been very good academically, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's my thing. I've been, I'm smart, yeah. you know, I've, I've always did well in school, straight A's and all of that. I love math. I love everything. I love English. I love math. I'm good at most things that I do because I'm just, it's not an egotistic, it's just who I am, yeah. you know. So when I was in New York, I did my undergrad in English literature, which is, you know, writing, and that was my passion. And I did economics because I also like math. But I didn't really question, is this who I am? No, I was, in, I was 18, and yeah. nobody teaches you. This is a problem with education today. Nobody allows you to know yourself and to sit in your skin and to feel at home in your body. So you don't really know the difference between what you're good at and what makes you feel at peace or feel in flow. You don't realize, you don't learn those things when you're younger. So I just knew I wanted to be in New York. I was lost. And at that point, September the 11th happened. The only thing an Indian could get a job in was technology or finance, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna do my master's in economics, <laughs> you know, cause I could. 
And I got a scholarship. I went to grad school. I did well. And then I, I was a statistician, you know, because I lived in New York City. <laughs> Uh, because that was the dream, right? Yeah. You're in your 20s, you're living in New best York. City. And best yeah. city ever, no yeah. regrets, lovely. But I wasn't really thinking. I was just doing the job and then living my life. And did it really make me wake up in the morning with joy? No, but it was a means to living my 20s in New York. Yeah. And then I moved to Dubai. Well, how did that happen? Because I always, you yeah. know, I love these stories. Yeah. It's always like, <laughs> you like, like, don't skip anything. Yeah, because, you know, yeah. also for me, like I yeah. moved from London, like everyone has yeah. this tipping yes. point where do they see opportunity? Is yeah. it um, a moment of change? Do they come with friends or family? So I always yeah. find because Dubai is this, I really call it this magical city I of, so much. you know, yeah. I've been so proud to just be a part of the fashion yeah. industry and yeah. watch it adapt and grow and then yeah. go into the media side of it. Yeah. And just like you, you yeah. ended up coming to Dubai, which I want to hear how that happened yeah. because you were leading the top two publications yeah. here. Yeah. So how that happened how? is my best friend from college lived here and I had visited her before. And um, I, you know, I wanted to leave New York because it was really depressing. I was 28 and yeah. it was done. Like, yeah. you know, after some time, you can't. And my family is in India and I would see them for home. three weeks, yeah. three weeks a year. Yeah. And I, I've i never grown up in India really. And so I could not imagine myself living in India, yeah. but I wanted something that felt like both. And I came to Dubai and I, I honestly loved it. Like, the moment I landed here, I was like, this place is lovely, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I moved to Dubai. Uh, I was um, in 2009, 8, 2008, December, deliberately. And my company in New York um, was expanding in the Middle East. And so I had the opportunity to do that. Um, but then soon, you know, I, it, I, I just started, I feel like there are two really important people, uh, times in a person's life, between 28 and 32, and between 36 and 43. So these are the times in your life where you really get punches in the face. You know, this... <laughs> Wait, what is, is the called, punch in the face in their 20s? Punch in your face, right? the first time you actually yeah. learn what it is to grow up. Yeah. And the second one is to actually become yourself. Yeah. You know? But the first one is, is the responsibility. Yes, you learn to become an adult. Course, and yeah. something really tough happens. Everyone has had something really hard happen to them between 28 and 32. Yeah. And then between 36 and 43. You know, these are the times in your life. So I moved here. I was completely miserable, um, you know, and, and I, I, was, um, I was married. And, um, and, you know, God bless him, uh, but it wasn't for me. And so I knew that I had to make my life on my own. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not enjoy the career that I was in. It was barely a career. It was me, like, hanging on to... What was I doing then and what am I doing now? Like, I don't really resonate. And my friend um, got me an internship at uh, Masala uh, because I was, I was writing for them. I did a bunch of projects for them. Yeah. I would help her out, you know. Uh, and so I got an internship. I worked for free for about five months. No way. Yeah, for free. And then the editor of Masala resigned and they offered me the, role. the lifestyle editor position. Okay. And so then I took on that job. I quit my New York job. I took on that job. And uh, yeah, and um, I worked my way up. So I, in two years, I became the editor of Masala. And then I was at Masala for five years. And then I got offered Hello to launch Hello in the region. And then I launched Hello. And I had my son. Um, and then I got offered Cosmo. And Which are all incredible titles yeah they're incredible they're yeah. incredible and i i did enjoy everything till hello until i had my child it's so funny i thought i was completely okay because here i am you know i'm i've transformed myself I've, i'm independent and, and in between all of that i i met my husband yeah. you know um uh about a year after i got divorced uh i met my current husband and we dated for four years and uh I'd learned the lessons, you know, that I needed to learn. And I, and I found somebody who I think is me, someone who I, is my wavelength, who, yeah. who is me, you know. And, uh, and then we, we were together for four years. We got married and then I had my child. And I was 36. So up until 35, I thought I was winning, you know, at life. I 
have this great career. I'm, you know, I've found the relationship that is on my wavelength and me, and I'm doing well, you know. And um, I, the moment I gave birth to my son, I went from 100 to zero in a split second. And all the ghosts of my past, all the pain that I had repressed, came up and I looked at this being and I was, I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe. I was like, what am I doing? I, I can't do this. And it was panic attack to another degree. I just fell apart. And I remember my ex-boss, who you know really well, yeah. Sue, came home when I was five months pregnant and she offered me Cosmo. And um, and I, I, I went blindly. I was like, okay, I guess I'll do this. And I remember calling my husband up at two in the morning saying, I've forgotten how to write. And I was crying. I was like, I've forgotten how to, I could not function. And so I don't even know how I did it. I think it's just, I did it. I I, I was at Cosmo for three years yeah. and it was great. Like we made a huge success yeah. of it for those three years. I was going to say, I'm like, I'm hearing this story because yeah. I'm watching it from the from other the side. Outside. From the which outside. Which is like this leading American magazine makes yeah. this incredible splash in the Middle East. Yeah. You're at the helm of it. Yeah. Um, you're yeah. known as like the top, yeah. you know, editor in chief for all these publications. Yeah. And then literally the backside yeah. is things feel like they're crumbling. Yeah. No, they were crumbling. Yeah. I could not be alone in a room with my son. I could not breathe. So I didn't understand why this was happening. And, and I, and of course I had him when I was 36. So I tell you, 36 to 43 is an insane time in life. And I, um, met Dr. Shafali. She was at the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Festival and I'd heard about her before through another friend. Okay, so let's pause for yes. the audience. Yes. So you stopped this career. I didn't stop it yet. Okay, okay so you're still at Cosmo. I'm at Cosmo, miserable. You're at, you're at Cosmo. Yeah. You're a young mom. Yeah, not that young. No, you're young, like a first time mom. First you're time You're young, mom. everything yeah. is new. This is yeah. like a new responsibility. And Dr. Shafali, if people don't know, she is a very well-known, she's on yeah. Oprah's speed dial, right? Yes. She's been interviewed yeah. several times on Oprah, yeah. best-selling author. Yeah. She comes to the UAE to speak in Sharjah. Yes. Yeah. So I'd heard about her before. Uh, she is the founder of, of Conscious Parenting. Yeah. You know, so she's a parenting expert. And uh, I had already resigned from Cosmo in July because, mm -hmm. but then they would not, let me leave. They were like, we need you, you to stay for like yeah. X amount of time. And and I was miserable. You know, I just could not stay. So I was miserable. But then I was so uncomfortable. And I, I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, I'm going to start this business. And I'm going to start that business. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that. Because you know, Rosamond, when you've had a career all your life, and you make this decision, you're so uncomfortable yeah. to not have a next action plan yeah you know so I had this crazy entrepreneurial action plan without really understanding myself and I and I was I was a mess I was a complete mess I could not be around my child I was panicking half the time I was a disaster okay and uh I interviewed her when I just turned 40 I turned 40 in 2019 and uh she was like uh, I said so you know people talk about postpartum depression but my son is three years old and I'm still miserable, you know. And she was like, how can you give what you didn't get? And I've heard this before, but I'd just turned 40 and I something, somehow, something opened up. And I just realized for the first time, I felt, I knew it all intellectually, but I felt how malnourished I was, how little nurture I had received, how I had taken care of my mother at night when she was sick, thrashing about how I had taken care of my sister, how I had grown up without anyone, yeah. you know, and the pain of seeing your parent unwell and helpless and all of that, I felt it in my body. And, and I was like, oh my God. And I broke. I let myself break. For one year, I just, you know, when you're ready, you find the right healer. I found a great therapist through my friend and I spent the full year and that was COVID um, just breaking, just breaking. I let myself just drown and feel every ounce of the pain. You know, I relived it all. Um, Dr. Bessel van der Kork, no, Dr. Uh, Stanislav Grof, who is based here. No, he's one of the, he's a, uh, a genius, mm. a psychological genius. He's a doctor. Mm, okay. who, he says the death of any oh. emotion 
is re-experiencing that emotion with presence. I think it was him or Basil Van der Kolk, mm. one of them. And so basically, it is you re-experience your trauma with presence. So you have to feel everything you felt as a child. To let it but go. With presence. Yeah. But to let it go. To let it go. For it to leave your body. Yeah. Pain is meant to leave you. Mm-hmm. It's only because we repress it and we run away from it and we avoid it that that it stays and then it rules your life. You know, so I literally re-experienced everything with presence and it was so hard. It was so hard. It was, it was, if it wasn't for my son, I, I don't think I would have lived. Do you think you've healed? I think healing is an ongoing journey, yeah. but yeah, I think I've shed a very important layer. Yeah. I think I'm myself and, and now I know how to help. I know how to help myself. You know, I know that when, when something on the outside triggers you, you go within and you understand, why did that trigger me? Oh, this happened for this, this happened for that. And you go back to a memory, or even if you don't remember it consciously, you feel it in your body, you sit with that part in your body and you let yourself feel. I've cracked myself open, so I release very easily now. It's when you don't release, when you escape. When you keep when you everything run, inside. You inside. Oh, you do. Yeah. Why, why? And that one year that I took off, I did nothing. I did not work. I just took a course under Dr. Shefali for one hour a day because that fed my soul. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the time, I would be in the room for two hours a day just with myself doing therapy and then sitting with my feelings, crying, releasing, and then with my child. And then I was COVID. So in a way, I was fortunate because I had all this time. time. But also, it's unfortunate because your child is at home with you. Yeah. You know, but I did nothing. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to pause and feel that this uncomfortable, horrible, creepy, like feeling where you're, you're so uncomfortable in your skin and you're shaking and you're, you have to sit with that for it to all release, you know, because it's very easy to distract yourself from those feelings doing a thousand things. Mm-hmm. So if you have the privilege, which I did, um, of taking a break, you know, you have the, you can, you have the financial privilege, or you, you have someone supporting you at some level, but you're not spending, you make a budget, you plan ahead and you just take a break for some time. And if you're able to do that, then you must do it because that is the beginning of you truly being yourself. And I think the most profound gift you can give yourself is you don't have to be anything or do anything for me to love you or to want to be with you. That inner peace, you know? I love that. Yeah. So you don't have to ask anyone to love you. No, you don't have to do anything Thing. or be anything for you to love you or for yeah. you to be comfortable with in your yourself. skin. And even now in my life, so then I studied under Dr. Shefali. Mm-hmm. I, after that year, I applied. She has a conscious parenting coaching program. Yeah. And, and I really wanted to, you know, I did it my, for myself more than anything else because um, I knew what it was like to not have a mother. And I never wanted my son to go through that. I wanted to be... Oh a mother to him, you know, I wanted to really be a mother to him. And and so I studied under her and it was an eight month course. And then I started working with parents and children. And I realized that I wanted to learn more because this was not enough. Um, and she went to this university in California called CIIS. It's the California Institute of Integral Studies. And it's the only place in the world that does mind, body, soul healing. So holistic healing. healing yeah. Like, Everything from dream work to depth psychology to um, to astro psychology mm-hmm. to you know uh, everything shamanism you know indigenous work like somatic work like true healing um, and she was like this is the only place that I would go to and I applied I got in and I remember I was at the information session and there's the Sri Yantra symbol at the information session and I said this looks like it's from India yeah. you know? They said, oh, this is from the Sri Aurobindo Ashram, which is where we're founded from. And my husband grew up in the Aurobindo Ashram. No way. Uh, his grandfather, great-grandfather was the first registrar of the school. My in-laws went there. My brother-in-law works at the ashram. His family. So what do you think that is? Do you think that's manifestation? You think, what is that? It's that it all magic. comes together. It's magic. Why do you marry this person? Why do you live the life that you do? Your, who you are with says a lot about who you are, you know, and it's like coming home, you know, we're on this path together. That's why I said I felt like I'd come, 
you know, he's not everybody's cup of tea. He's my cup of tea. This mm. is my. So when I realized that, I was so humbled. I was like, okay, I'm exactly where I need to be. Yeah. You know, and not because of him, it's because of the universe. How come? You know. But also, when you're prepared, right? Like yeah. when you are prepared. Yeah. And present, I feel yeah. like everything starts coming into alignment. Yeah. And you know, people have gotten what manifestation is very wrong. Manifestation mm -hmm. is not visualizing something. Manifestation is really simply bringing your dark into awareness, the ugly, broken, vile, si vile sides of you into awareness and loving it. Mm -hmm. And you become whole. When your vibration becomes whole emotionally and then you're able to be spiritual after that, mm -hmm. not before. Because yeah. true spiritual work begins with sitting with your difficult feelings, not bypassing them. Yeah. Then you go to spirituality when you know how to sit with the discomfort, you know? That is the hardest. Exactly. And most people talk about everything no, before they know how to sit with is, themselves. Discomfort yeah. is the hardest, but also when you take that break, yeah. and I did it right now for six months, yeah. and it was, no one could understand what I was going through because yeah. people, yeah. one, I didn't know what to do all day. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be lost. Right, but I'm yeah. so used to having this crazy intense schedule. Then when people ask you what you do and you literally like, yeah. <laughs> like nothing yeah. actually. And it was so hard, but it wasn't like it was nothing. It was that I was working on myself. Yeah. I was focusing on my body and my health. Yeah. And like, I was doing things that I needed to do at this age, at this time and to be really present. Um, so for me, it was very much a health focus, but yeah, the discomfort is actually the hardest it's part. It's the first step. And so I tell people, do not meditate. Do not do anything till you know how to work with your body right. and to be emotional. People meditate and they do all of the spiritual. They haven't really done the... The emotional work is the first step. You can't bypass that. You can't. So I don't even know what I was saying. So, But then I applied and I'm now finishing my master's and starting my PhD. Um, because I really want to have the tools to help people, mm -hmm. you know, and I think your true textbook is yourself. Yeah. So breaking myself open, cracking that open in every possible manner. I've literally not worked very much in the past three years. Um, I've just been studying. I have a few clients and I do a little bit of work, but I, I've made myself my work because I feel like I need to invest in that to really be able to help people. And now I think I'm ready. Uh, but you've done something so interesting because... Yeah mothers, parents, I don't even say mothers, parents are yeah. resonating yeah. with your experience. Yeah. Um, you have this Instagram account where people can DM you, book an appointment, yeah. but you're doing something right. You're speaking yeah. the truth yeah. about parenting. Yeah. Um, you're speaking the truth about that it's not easy, right? Yeah. But it's also, it's about being very much connected as parents how you're raising your child and right like your first child is yourself your you first know, child is yourself I, I honestly the work that i really want to do somebody asked me what do you want to do i said i want to talk to parent people before they have children and i want to talk to prepare people them because there is no emotional preparation for a baby and everything is just propaganda and lies i'm really sorry it is and there's too much advice out there even now, I was on a panel a few months ago, a couple of months ago, and you know there were these lovely parenting experts next to me, and one was talking about, like they were giving advice on how to play with your child and how screen time is bad for your child and this and that. And I saw the women in the audience and not one of them looked happy. Everybody looked crestfallen and traumatized. There was so much shame in that room. And when it came to me, I said, all of this ad advice is wonderful, but Honestly, I think the biggest epidemic we face as human beings is, and as parents is shame. And I said, I hate being a mother. I hate measuring my life according to someone else's needs. To fit my life to the needs of another, God, I hate it sometimes. You know, and I said, I hate getting on the floor and playing with my child, the same boring game. I mean, I would do anything but want to do that. And everyone clapped and smiled and looked relieved. Are Why? you speaking the truth? Because I am speaking the truth, <laughs> truth and yeah. not many people. There is so much advice out there, Rosamond, about everything. When you should marry, how many children you should have, how you should be financially independent, how you should parent. Oh, you should co-sleep. Oh, you should breastfeed. Oh, no, don't breastfeed. Give formula. Oh, you should do this. And this is a school you should send your child to. And this is what you do. And these are the activities. And you must play with your child. And you must be gentle with your child. And you must be... 
honestly, people forget a very crucial step. Where are you in all of this? How kind are you being to yourself mm-hmm. in all of this? How aware are you of your emotions in all of this? And ironically, it is when you say, I hate being a mother, that you are the best mother. Because you are acknowledging the shadow. You're acknowledging those dark instincts and you're loving them. And you're saying, you know what, it's okay. When you look at your child and you see your child throwing a tantrum or beating someone or telling you they hate you, do you stop loving your child? Yeah. Or would you be mm. like, shut up, mm. sit quietly in a corner and don't talk, don't say anything. Then why do you do it to yourself? Yeah. If you hate playing with your child or you hate the fact that, you know, you don't have a full day free to do whatever you please, then why are you shutting yourself up and not allowing yourself to speak the truth? Mm-hmm. Because that energy festers inside you and children are feeling beings. They're not thinking beings. So you could be saying all the right things and doing all the right things, but the only thing they will feel is that energy that you've tucked away inside. Mm-hmm. And they're like, mommy doesn't feel like a safe space. And that's when the trauma begins. You're like, well, I did everything, right? I picked him up from school. I put him to bed at night. I'm feeding him. I'm making him a priority. But you don't feel safe. You could spend 20 minutes with your child and those 20 minutes could feel like they feel safe. They feel like you're okay. And you will see the secure attachment there. It's not about time. It's about that work, that dark work, you know. Um, and about being so present, right? With yourself. Self, yeah. With yourself. And present with yourself is not just sitting with your breath or that it is sitting with the parts of you that you hate Mm -hmm. it is sitting with the parts of you that you don't want to see you know i'm gonna burst into tears i feel like this is like so yeah yeah and that that is healing that is healing so for for me now i am ready because i think only when you do the work can you share it you know um and ultimately and on the same panel they asked me what do you do and it's so funny when you said i didn't know what to say to people when they say what do you do and I said, well, I can tell you what I have done. And I'm, I can tell you right now that I'm sitting on a chair on this panel, but I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. But right. I will tell you that I am myself. I'm Kavita. And I will never do anything that doesn't feel right to myself. I so love tomorrow, that. I could leave everything. And, you know, I'm in the process of starting something. But mm-hmm. I'm, I sit with myself. I'm like, whether I ever start it, or whether I started, I'm going to actively love myself, imagining, what if I never do this? And what if I do it? Does it really define me? No. And tomorrow, if I feel like this parenting thing, none of this fits who I am, and I don't feel like it resonates, I will pick up and I will do something that makes me feel like me. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone asks me, what do you do? I say, I do me. I do me. You know, I do me every day. And that is ultimately the only thing that matters. So I want to ask you, yeah, because I love all of this. <laughs> There's so much focus on mothers yeah. when it comes to parenting. Yeah. What about fathers and, and parenting together? Like, what is the yeah. solution to making sure that, you know, you kind of always hear the good cop, bad cop, right? It's, or it's, um, you know, the mom's the more disciplinary one. Or like, how do you how do you do teamwork as parenting? Yeah. What are some tips? It's so tough. You know, I have so many people who've asked me this and there is no right answer because men, I feel, you know, we talk so much about mothers. I want to talk about fathers because they're so emotionally handicapped. We're raising our sons differently now, but the men of this generation have been told not to cry, be brave, be tough, Mm -hmm. be strong. They're emotionally incapacitated, you know. So a lot of the time, the men are not comfortable with your child having a meltdown or a tantrum and they're not able to sit with those feelings and because when a child has a tantrum or a meltdown that's actually a way that they're processing how to release emotion and then regulate themselves and then you help them regulate themselves Mm -hmm. but most men are so uncomfortable and Most parents, but most men are so uncomfortable that they're like, stop crying, don't cry. Come on, look at that bird. Here's a lollipop, you know, and it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time I tell mothers who come to me, I'm like, don't expect, even if your partner is not on the same page as you, it doesn't matter because a child just needs one person to love them, believe in them and to feel safe with for there to be change because children know 
what feels right. Mm -hmm. So whether you're, and it's the way, the good cop, bad cop, honestly, it's just about connection. You know, when your child feels connected to you, then they will want to listen to you. And don't ever tell your child to do something. Just don't do it. Like, for example, I don't let my son play any video games. All his friends play video games. Mm -hmm. All of them. Okay. And so he asked me, why, why? And I can tell you, well, he's very curious. And yeah. I said, looks like you're really curious to play video games. You know, and I said, let me tell you why I don't let you play video games. And I showed him an entire video on dopamine. He's also seven now, you know, but before that I was like, it's bad for your body, it's bad for your brain. Imagine if you had a hundred ice creams at one go. That's how a video game makes you feel. It's a dopamine hit. It's like handing your child a, an addiction, mm -hmm. you know, it messes up the neurology yeah. of your brain. So when I showed him that video, he still tells me I'm curious. I feel like playing it. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's it's quite fun. I said, it makes you feel really like, ah. Oh. I said, but it's not good for you. It's not good for you. So please tell me about shopping. <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, it's a dopamine hit. <laughs> right? like, everything is a dopamine yeah, yeah. hit. So, you know, like, so when I explain things to your child, explain things to your child and then allow them to express how much they hate it. And that connection is everything. Mm -hmm. And then if he really wants to play a video game, I'm like, you know what? Try it if you want, but remember you have one brain and you have one body. Mm -hmm. And notice how people behave when they're with their video games. Do they want to talk to you? Do they want to be around you? Are they jittery and hyperactive? And he's like, yeah. I said, so you see how they are. Their brain is changing. So I said, you can be, and if you really want to try it, we can do it together. I can sit with you. We can play a game. If you really want to do it, we can. Yeah. But the reason why I say try not to is because it's not good for you, mm. you know? And so are these, like, I feel like that's such a great example. Are these, one, are these one of the tools that you're learning in your one-on-one -on -one sessions with clients? Yeah, I mean, we talk mm. about everything, right? We talk about everything. Um, but I work with parents of children because to me, children are pure, children yeah. are perfect. They are just blank slates that we project ourselves onto. Mm. And so what is wrong with my child? What is you know, ADHD, autism, mm -hmm. all of these things? What is wrong with my child? What is wrong with my child? My child is hyperactive. I, I One school diagnosed the child, and I, mean, I have such problems with education in general, but um, diagnosed the child saying, oh, he has a chronic non-listening disorder or something. I don't remember the actual wording, but it was like, he's got a chronic non-listening disorder yeah. or something. And I was like, what is that? What, that's a made-up label. Yeah. And I and I told the mother that I was speaking to, I was like, have you listened to your child? I was like, when was the last time you listened to your child? Why would your child listen to you when you haven't modeled what listening is, is to him? Yeah. You know, my child doesn't listen. My child, I keep telling my child to brush his teeth. He doesn't brush his teeth. And I was like, okay, but how, let's just flip the script. And when he says, mama, 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 what are you doing? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. You're on your phone or you're doing 15, 20 different things. And so he's modeling that behavior. He's modeling non-listening from you, That's you know? And I said, when you start listening to your child and actually model listening to your child, your child will listen to you. So the teacher is not earning the respect of the child. And that is why the child is not listening mm -hmm. to the teacher. But it's very easy to blame the child. And give them an acronym. <laughs> right. And to label them. Yeah, because label they're them. children, yeah. right? They're smaller than you. They're weaker than yeah. you. They, they're easy to control and to label and to blame. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to look at yourself and say, wait, this is me. I'm the one who's making the mistakes. And so let me look within mm -hmm. and figure out what is stopping me. And not from a place of shame. The teacher is overworked, tired, probably has a billion things on her hands, has a lot of children and she's exhausted. And I've heard that schools ask teachers to take like, I mean, six pictures a day and send a report card every day for each child. And there's like 25 children in a class. And I'm like, so the child is playing a game and you're taking pictures of them. And then, you, oh, you have to take a picture of another yeah, child. So yeah. imagine this poor teacher is so dysregulated, poor thing, yeah. that she's doing this. So why do parents need those pictures? Don't they want the teacher to be present with the child? Of course, yeah. You know, but we've gotten the entire system wrong, you know. And so that's why the ch teacher doesn't have the patience yeah. 
to really listen to the child and then there's this label and then the parent gets worried and and then they go to a doctor and there's a medication and like not really we don't need all of that mm. i mean in a few cases yes when it's Except, but those yeah, cases are very rare and exceptional, exceptional. by the way mm-hmm. they're not like now the amount of people diagnosed with adhd it's insane i gave a friend of mine a book the other day because one of her acquaintances was said that her child had adhd by gabor mate have you heard of gabor mate he's like the world's leading trauma therapist okay. he's incredible please read his stuff there is a book called uh, scattered minds just read scattered minds and you will know what adhd really is adhd is when you are so in pain like the present moment is so painful that it becomes habit to escape to escape to escape that's what adhd is rooted in trauma mm-hmm. you know and gabor mate he's a doctor he's incredible he's a world's leading light in trauma he teaches you how to heal that without medication you know how you use the medication as a stopgap to true healing and so when my friend acquaintance read that she was like oh my god why does nobody tell you this me. you know because it's hard work yeah and you're actually healing people to the point where they don't really need all of that help anymore you know so i was telling you earlier it's not that hard rosamond it is hard because you have to do a lot of inner work but it's not that hard because suddenly you feel free you know that everything begins with you you are the power and so you don't take anything personally you look at your child and you can help your child because you can healing is putting space between a trigger and a response mm-hmm. so your child triggers you you pause and say okay what is this about me this is about me you walk out of the room take a deep breath come back and say i'll be back mama is having big feeling you come back you don't take it personally and you sit with your child that is it our bodies know how to heal themselves if you just allow them the discomfort of healing one of yeah. the things that i've just been thinking about is i feel like for women 40 is such a magic number yeah oh my god and when i hear your story actually for the first time of your childhood to where you are now there is something quite pivotal and and i say this even you know i've said it before like even for my personal journey there was something literally 2020 where i just felt like yeah. all the lights came on and i started having clarity in yeah. so many aspects from career to personal life and and when I, you actually sit down which is what i did at that moment of 40 and and looked at my life from where i was born to where i was now so living in four countries and all of that to where you are now you start realizing every experience you go through leads you to where you are yeah. today and i feel like that's exactly what your journey was yeah. and so as much as it's so impressive to hear about new york and all of this exciting life you had all that trauma you had now is coming in the forefront in the present day to really help people absolutely and this is what i was telling someone the other day when they you know in in in, a, in the university that i go to all your work is your journey with academic context so yeah. you're like literally ripping yourself apart and then putting it so someone read one of my papers and they were like god i'm so sorry this happened to you and i said you know what this is the life that i chose and life is meant to be hard and it's meant to be beautiful mm-hmm. and your pain is your power so don't be sorry this is my power but to authentically say that yeah. this is my power this is my gift to this world to have this pain with a lot of protection my parents are my biggest champions do you do you understand how evolved and wonderful they are to be so proud of me as i talk about this i'm south asian mm-hmm. i'm in you know yeah. what it's like we don't talk about this yeah. they are so proud of me so i have the protection of this and i've healed my relationship with my parents so beautifully and they're like they're so proud of you and for me to talk about my mother's ill health for me to talk about all of this and the ways that all the pain has happened i mean what a gift to have that support so i have pain but i have immense privilege you know and immense protection we always have both you know and i feel and, like you found your purpose i mean i'm myself yeah i don't know i am myself you know but then you look back in your life at your life and you know the funny thing is rosman you knew who you were when you were 
-hmm. You knew it at three. What did you love doing when you were three? Mm -hmm. I spent all my time with other babies when I was three. I love children all my life. Why? Why? Why was I going to random people's houses changing kids' diapers? Mm -hmm. My friends would make fun of me. Mm -hmm. I would be the person who would show up for five hours changing diapers, mm -hmm. burping. Why? You know, you know who you are. It is this conditioning and the noise and the inability to be with your pain and with all of you that stops you from being who you are. Mm. And at any moment you need to walk away, you need to be prepared to walk away from everything. Yeah. Because of you, because you matter, you know, and that is the ultimate truth of life. I love this. Oh. There were so many nuggets of information. Oh. I couldn't stop listening to you. Um, Sorry, I talked so much. No, but it yeah. is so relevant and so authentic and so present. And I'm so happy you shared your story. Oh, thank you. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen for the next phase of the conscious parent, which is exciting. I, I know you have a new business on, on the rise. I mean, it's, I'm not, I don't know what it is yet. It's, but it's coming it's to shape. Business. I don't know what it is, shape. but there's something that's taking form. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I'll keep you posted. So or it may not be anything. And I may just be, you know, I may just not do anything. So, yeah. So here at Indigo Living, our motto is, what is living beautifully to you? Being happy in my own skin alone without any identity. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Follow Kavita, Conscious Parent on Instagram. We'll put all the details Conscious below. Dot parent, yeah. Conscious Dot Parent. Conscious Dot Parent on Instagram. <laughs> we'll put all the details here. And thank you for following us and watching us every episode. We love hearing from you. Continue to follow us on Instagram and, of course, YouTube, Indigo Living UAE. Wishing you a very, very happy new year and we look forward to seeing you next season.